When I introduced the Pythagorean theorem to a group of students years ago, I said, what do Euclid, Pythagoras, and President James A. Garfield have in common? And they look at me like, are you crazy? Well, we can figure that Euclid and, and Pythagoras probably the Pythagorean theorem. Well, you're right there. Well, Garfield, while he was a member of Congress in 1876, in the New England Journal, published an, an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And it's a very lovely proof because it needs nothing but the most elementary geometry that every high school kid can f clearly understand. Unfortunately, not enough teachers know about it and use it because it's a very nice turn-on. Here we have a trapezoid. That's a quadrilateral with exactly two parallel sides, the top and the bottom here. And inside we inscribed, as you might see, a uh, right triangle. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to represent, and this is what Garfield did, he represented the area of the trapezoid in two different ways. The traditional way is that the trapezoid is equal to one-half the, uh, the, the sum of the bases squared. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the one-half the height times the sum of the bases. Well, the height in this case, as you can see in the diagram, is a plus b, and the sum of the bases is a plus b, so we have one-half a plus b squared. Well, you can take the area of that trapezoid and break it up into the component parts, and by doing that, you would get two uh, right triangles whose legs are a and b, so those two triangles have an area of one-half a, b, and then the right triangle that's sort of uh, ob oblique there, uh, tilted, has legs length c, and its area is one-half c squared, the product of the legs. Well, the sum of that, if we just do a little very, very simple algebra, is two times one-half ab plus one-half c squared. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that value and we're going to equate it with the one above. And when we do that, and we do just a very, very simple, most elementary algebra, you'll notice what comes out? a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, which everybody remembers, because if anything, that's the only thing that people remember from their school days, a squared plus b squared plus c squared. It's like, do you know your ABCs? Well, just a word about Pythagorean triples. It, it was worth a book, so I wrote a book about Pythagorean triples, uh, but Pythagorean theorem as well. And the triples are truly amazing, and you'll see how they tie in with Fibonacci in a moment. But uh, the a squared plus b squared is c squared, everybody knows. And here are just a couple of the common triples. 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. And we have the 5, 12, 13, the other famous and often memorized uh, um, right triangle. In other words, the legs are length 5 and 12, and the hypotenuse is length 13. And then we have one that's a little less common, 11 squared plus 60 squared is equal to 61 squared. And I have this one up, this 39 squared plus 80 squared is equal to 89 squared. It's also a Pythagorean triple, and you'll see why I put that one up there. I skipped quite a few in the process, but we're going to come back to that last one in just a moment. Matter of fact, Euclid, among the many things that he did, and by the way, there is a, a lore out there that uh, Abraham Lincoln was enamored with Euclid's work. As a matter of fact, it is said that while he was a young lawyer traveling around in his Illinois area, that in his saddlebag he always kept a copy of the Elements, Euclid's famous book, The Elements. And he referred to it regularly because he loved the logic that Euclid used in developing geometry and, ma and other aspects of mathematics. But here, Euclid did a little bit of number theory, and he came up with these formulas where you can generate Pythagorean triples. In other words, A would be, would the three sides of the right triangle would be A, B, and C, and that he said for values of M and N, you can generate different values of uh, triples. So for A, you have M squared minus N squared, B is 2 times MN, and C is M squared minus, uh, plus N squared. And if you allow different values of M and N, uh, you get the uh, uh, Pythagorean triples, A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Here's a little bit of the algebra for those of the purists who need to see it demonstrated. But it's a very, very simple elementary algebra. Of course, if you use relatively prime M and N, then you will get what we call 
primitive Pythagorean triples, those are Pythagorean triples which have no common multiple, like 3, 4, 5, or 5, 12, 13. One that's not primitive would be 6, 8, 10, because it has a common factor of 2. So, now, here's a really unusual way of generating triples. Now, you saw Euclid's very lovely, beautiful, mathematical way of doing it. Well, here's a kind of a cheating way, if you will, but it works. Supposing we write mixed numbers. Now, you remember those from your school days. Just mixed numbers, one and one-third, two and two-fifths, three and three-sevenths, four and four-ninths. Notice the pattern. The, the whole number part is one, two, three, four, five. The numerators are one, two, three, four, five. And the denominators are consecutive odd numbers. Three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, and so on. Now you say, well, where's that going to get us? Watch this. We're going to take them and convert them to improper fractions. Now, everybody knows how to do that. To take one and one-third is four-thirds. Two and two-fifths becomes twelve-fifths. Now, you're done. Because four-thirds are the legs of a right triangle. Five and twelve are the legs of a right triangle. Twenty-four and seven are the legs of a right triangle. In other words, every one of the fractions you generate this way will give you the legs of a right triangle. And if you want the hypotenuse, you just square those two and add them. So here you have a neat way using just simple mixed numbers to generate Pythagorean triples. Now, we take a look and we're going to combine. Obviously, you know by now you're expecting this. Uh, we're going to combine the Pythagorean triples and the Fibonacci numbers. So let's take our little uh, famous four that we had from before the uh, four Fibonacci numbers that we choose at random. We're just choosing any four, but we choose those because they're not too big and ugly. So we have 3, 5, 8, and 13. Now, what we're going to do, it's a little contrived, but it works, and it works for any four. We're going to multiply the two middle numbers and double the result. So the two middle numbers here are 5 and 8, which is 5 times 8 is 40. Double that, you get 80. Now, hold the 80. Next thing we do is we're going to multiply the two outer numbers. The two outer numbers with 3 and 13. We multiply those two together, and we get 39. Now, we add the squares of those, uh, the two inner numbers, the 5 and 8. 5 squared plus 8 squared is 89. Now, do you remember the last triple that we had on the screen before? 39, 80, 89. Here it is again. So you can see that you can take the Fibonacci numbers, any four of them, and using this little algorithm, you get the, the Pythagorean triple. And if, in case you want to see how that works out, clearly we you need to take my word for it, but you can see on the screen that it does work. Now, there's another nice thing in mathematics that we um, don't really know much about, and it's, again, largely quirks of the number system, but we can show, we can justify it. And that is endless loops. And there are lots of them, and they're a lot of fun, where you do certain things, certain constant operations that gets you back to where you started or gets you to a particular point. Let's take, for example, a very simple one. You choose any four-digit number. Now, if you're watching this in a comfortable place and you have a piece of paper, I would suggest that perhaps you work along with this. And I'll try to go a little bit slower here to allow for a little um, uh, computation. Choose any four-digit number. Where and, and let's not choose one with all the same digits, like 5555 five, five, five or something. And we're going to now take those four digits and rearrange them. We're going to make the largest number and the smallest number out of them. OK? I think that should be pretty easy. Then you subtract those two numbers, obviously, the big one minus the little one. With this new number, you got another four-digit number. If, by the way, if you have a zero at the end or a zero at the beginning, don't lose that zero. You need it. With this new number, you do the same thing again. You make the largest and the smallest by rearranging digits. Subtract. Largest, smallest, and subtract. Eventually, you will get to 6174. Now, we're going to do this together. You've done it yourself. I assume you've succeeded. But if you need more time, maybe just stop at this point and then... Uh, Keep doing it until you get 6174. Now, we're going to do one together. We're going to take a, a number which we just selected randomly, 3203. We're going to arrange it 
And I put a zero in there so you can see how we need to work with the zero. Um, we're going to make the largest number out of it, which is to take the largest digit, put them in ascending order. Uh, 3320. Then the smallest digit. Now that's where the zero comes first. And we have 0233. Three. We're going to subtract them. We get 3087. Now we're going to rearrange those digits again. We get 8730 is the f largest number. The smallest number is 0378. We subtract them and we get 8,352. Repeat the process again. Make the largest number, which is 8,532. And make the smallest number, which is 2,358. And the difference, we get 6,174. Voila. I said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now, it doesn't have to happen. In, it could sometimes happen in one try. It could take several more tries. But since this is a rigged situation, I want to make sure it fit on one screen. So now let's see what happens. Let's continue the process again. Well, we take 6174, and we're going to make the largest number, which is 7,641, and the smallest number, 1,467. And we subtract them. Look what happens. We get 6174 again. And you keep on doing it. You're now in a loop. So you're going to keep on getting 6174. And it's an amazing thing. And this one you really can't algebraically justify. This is a quirk of the decimal number system. It's one of these really unusual things. But when you show it to people who are not yet convinced that math can be fun, well, this one ta go takes you a long way in that direction. Here's another loop. Get the sum of the squares of, any, of the digits of any number. Let's take a simple one like 5. And we take the square and we take 5 squared is 25. Now we're going to take the sum of the squares of the digits of 25, which is 2 squared plus 5 squared, 29. And again, we take the sum of the squares of the digits, 2 squared plus 9 squared, 85, and so on and so forth. You will eventually get to... We, 89. Now, once you be continue with 89, you will always end up again with 89. You are now in a loop. And so here again is a loop, and it can be done with lots of different numbers, but we chose 89 here because it's a manageable number. Basically, my objective was to show you that there is a lot of fun in mathematics. And the biggest problem that we have in our society today is not enough teachers know about the fun that you can have in mathematics. Unfortunately, we're testing the kids to death in the schools, and the teachers know they're being rated by the tests, and so every, that takes front row to everything else. But if we were to take a little time to show our students how important mathematics is, not because we show how important it is to build a building or make sure the bridge doesn't fall or anything like that, but to show that it's also fun and that you can enjoy it and that there's a lot of useful stuff that comes out of it will have gone a long way. I've often told teachers that if you take 15 minutes out in a lesson of something you're not going to test on, something that's just out there that's fun, that you'll have turned the kids on. It's like an investment. You invested 15 minutes, but you're going to get back in large numbers later on by the interest level you've generated with the kids. The second thing is, if we can turn on the parents and let the parents see that there are so many wonderful things that they weren't aware of in mathematics, then maybe parents will be a little bit more understanding in the following situation. Johnny comes home from school with two test grades, 75 in English and a 75 in math. What is the typical reaction of a parent? parent says, how can you get a 75 in English? Can't you speak? Can't you read? Can't you write? Come on, that's unacceptable. Unacceptable. You got a 75 in Am I glad you passed? I didn't do better myself. Now, where is the expectation for Johnny? He knows he's got to really strap down and do well in English. He's okay in math, so he can let that slide. In other words, our expectation, our lack of love for mathematics is hurting our society. We're entering, or we are already in a digital age where we talk about technology, where the young folks are being faced with all kinds of technological things, where problem solving is extraordinarily important, 
we need to pay more attention to what we do about mathematics, how we, what we expect of our children, what we expect of our teachers, and what we need to do to get people interested. And that's really what motivated me in the last decade to write a number of books on how we can turn people on to mathematics with topics that are of general interest. Sometimes you have to take a little path uh, on the side which takes you a little bit more to a more advanced stage. But when you read a book, you can choose what you read. Largely, the books are for the general audience. This is the kind of thing that we did in these books. This is the kind of thing we push at Mercy College when we're training teachers. And this is the kind of thing that I hope everybody watching this uh, show will also adopt. And I thank you for your time, and I hope you will leave with a love for mathematics and uh, see all the amazing things that lie in store for you in the field. Thank you.